guys for being here with us and everyone else that, that I know. Uh, it's good to see you, some of you, if, I, if, I, if I've met briefly. Uh, it's just a pleasure to have you. Uh, I can't tell you how privileged you are to be in a, in a church uh, with pastors who are really people of integrity, of, 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 of a good character, uh, and who love God above all. So they're not here to entertain you or to bamboozle you. They, they really are here to, to challenge you uh, to grow into all that God has for you. And, and that takes, that takes uh, risk because we live in a culture where people want simply affirmation. They don't want discipline. Amen. Right? And, and we know that you cannot have growth without discipline. Amen. That you, it requires to be successful in life, period. Whether you have Christ in your life or not, you need to apply discipline. Mm. And so in a culture that's entitled, that thinks things are owed to them, discipline is not a welcome dynamic. Mm -hmm. But anyone here, there's several uh, people here that, that manage people. You know that the most successful people you manage are those that can self-discipline. Right? That, that they don't need to be babysat as adults. But sometimes in the context of church, our job is to introduce that concept, to bring spiritual discipline, and in whatever area they allow us, and see them then practice that in other areas of their life. And that's the beautiful thing of influence, which I believe is, is the end result of, of righteous leadership is to be able to really influence. I, I, I want to give you a lot of information, and I'm got, kind of going to run through it. So it's not that I'm trying to rush, but I have a lot of stuff I want to give you. Take notes if you can. I know that you do a great job of, of recording everything here, so you can go back and see it over and over again on your app. Uh, so I feel confident that you can go back and, and get but. But lately, the Lord's been dealing with me on two dynamics. And, and, and they are being spirit-led and, and operating in a spirit of discernment. Can you say those again, please? Being spirit-led and operating in a spirit of discernment. And I'm going to unfold that and kind of help you understand what it is. I'm going to help you understand why it's important that we have it. And then how we can get it. Is that cool? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the journey we're going to take this morning. So, so if it becomes a little bit redundant, redundant and not typical Puerto Rican spit fire preaching, uh, <laughs> just, just hang with me yeah, because yeah. I, I want to impart something that's going to take you beyond today. Amen? Amen? Amen. So I want you to go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 6. And, of course, I want to give recognition to my beautiful wife, Yvonne, who's here with me. That's my foxy lady. <laughs> I can't call her my old lady because she really is older than me and she would get mad at me. So I stopped calling her my old lady. I'm okay with that because I feel good. All right. <laughs> there you go. She don't change, Bob, right? <laughs> Amen. So, but it's a blessing to have her here with me. I, I move around a lot, and I don't always have the privilege. She wasn't with me in Philadelphia, and it gets lonely, but whenever she's with me, I feel whole. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 through 23, and the word of the Lord reads as follows. Your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We've heard it said that our eyes are the window to our soul. As a matter of fact, that's a saying that even before Christ, we probably heard it because it's accredited to William Shakespeare. Uh, and, and there's a human view 
or the perspective from which William Shakespeare approached that saying that basically is this, looking at a person's eyes can give you insight into their soul. And that's in essence what William Shakespeare was saying. However, long before William Shakespeare was given life, God had granted his servants insights to this dynamic. And he spoke through the servant, through, through his servants, the revelation that our eyes are like a window to our soul. As light enters through a, a room through a window and lights up the entire room, so also what we look upon has the potential to influence our soul. And that's where, where the scripture is coming from that we just read or that Jesus is talking about. The reality that our eyes give access to things that are much more profound than just at surface level. Why? Because our soul can be defined as that part of our being that, that is where the intellect operates or the mind, the, the, the emotions operate or our heart, if you will, and the will of man. So what Christ in essence is saying is that what you allow to enter your eyes, especially if you gaze on it longer than you should, will affect how you think will affect how you feel, mm -hmm. and thus will affect how you act. Yeah. Are you tracking with me? Mm -hmm. Let us define sight, just, just from a, a real uh, uh, layman's perspective. Sight itself is simply part of our five senses. How many know? Smell, touch, taste, hear, sight. And we know that the result of sight or being able to see uh, gives us the capacity to perceive. Now, to perceive is to attain awareness of or understanding of something. In other words, from perceive or the capacity to perceive, we get the word perception. Perception is how you look at it. Not just that you see something, but what is your interpretation of it? Are you tracking with me? So perception is conclusions that we make based on information we have gained. As such, perception can be conditional, not always trustworthy. Well, I'll give you an example. If all my life I am, I am made to believe that, that Puerto Ricans are a bad people and I, and I live in an environment where I don't really interact with, with that, that culture the, the, with Puerto Ricans, the first time that I meet a Puerto Rican and they tell me I'm of Puerto Rican descent, immediately I'm going to put up walls, I'm going to be cautious, I'm going to be suspicious, whether there's merit for that or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And the reason is because my perception comes from the information that I've been fed. Amen. Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so with that, I'll make this statement again. Perception is conclusions we make based on the information we've gained. As such, perception can be conditional, meaning not always trustworthy. In other words, our life experiences can often affect how we view things. Mm -hmm. Right? So people will say to me, <laughs> well, do you hunt? I'm like, nah, I, I, I don't hunt. I, I, I don't go out into the woods with a rifle 
where, where ain't a whole lot of people look like me. Because <laughs> I think, if I'm on the other side, I look at a deer, and I look at a Phil Hernandez, I can shoot a deer any, any year. I don't get a chance to shoot one of these. Come on. <laughs> I know that's a bad joke, <laughs> but that's 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 my perception. That's why I don't hunt. And so, our our life experiences affect how we view things. I gave you just my perspective on hunting, as as crazy as it is. It's my perspective. As such, without Christ in our lives, we are incapable of truly discerning good and evil. Especially since evil often disguises itself as good. Therefore, just as looking at something too long can affect our soul, how we view something can also hinder us. Paul exposes false apostolic people making the very point I just made. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 through 15. These people are false apostles. They are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I'm not surprised. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Now listen to what he says after this. So it is no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. That's profound. He said that in the end they will all get the punishment they deserve. But what he's saying is that evil will represent itself as good. So we know that part of the ploy of the enemy is sophisticated deception. Meaning much more, much more strategic than you and I can ever truly understand. Especially when we're in the midst of a situation and or circumstance. Therefore, it is imperative that we believers develop our spiritual sight and discernment. So what is spiritual sight? Here's a quick definition of spiritual sight. Spiritual sight is our capacity to see clearly what God wants us to do and to see the world from his point of view. Now this is very important because if when I see something, I interpret it from my point of view, I recognize that that's corrupt because I've, I've been given information that doesn't always line up with the word of God. So, so I have to engage God in a process that allows him to renew my mind. Romans chapter 12 says, Be not conformed, and he's talking to believers, Be not conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed or changed, how? By the renewing of your mind. Now it's important that we understand that even though we, we see with our eyes, we really don't see with our eyes. Mm -hmm. Our eyes are the instrument that project the image to our brain. What we really see with is our mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Right? Yeah. <laughs> because it's in your mind. Your eyes project the image and your mind interprets the image. So, so, so perception is very connected to the information that's in my mind. 
Again, I said this may be a little bit redundant. I'm, I'm coming at it from different perspectives to help us understand why it's important that our minds be renewed from our own interpretation of what we see to a biblical worldview or life view. Am I making sense to us? Yes. Yes. And without that, because how we think is how we're going to respond, how we're going to act, how we're going to behave. Amen. Right? I remember when I was in the counseling field and I worked with, with uh, juveniles involved in delinquency, we used to use terminology such as we've got to confront the stinking thinking. Mm -hmm. Meaning the thinking that is corrupt. The thinking that is... I'll give you an, a, another example of just buckle your seatbelt because I know my example can be a little bit thrown off. But I'll give you another example. I didn't realize I was a criminal until I moved to Pennsylvania. Because everybody around me in New York was running a hustle. So that was normal. When everyone's running a hustle, when you live in an area like I live, Spanish Harlem, where survival is the methodology employed, everybody's running a scam, everybody's running a hustle, that becomes normal. You don't realize that it's criminal until you come out of it. For example, exchanging your food stamps for cash. Something that simple. Well, the government gave you $200 worth of food stamps, I'm going to get $100 worth of cash. That's criminal. You're not supposed to do that. Right? You know, going into a, 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 a bike shop that, for whatever reason, had been broken into, you didn't break it, but I'm going in there and grab something. That's criminal. <laughs> well, I didn't think that was criminal. That was a hustle. That's how you survive in the hood. You, uh, are, you, are you hearing what I'm saying? The, this, is, this is important because, because part of our transformation involves changing the way we think. It might have been functional for Phil, but it wasn't until I truly entered what is functional that I realized how dysfunctional it was. Amen? Now people say, yeah, but sometimes dysfunction works. Dysfunction can help you survive, but it will never help you prosper. And if you do, it will be very short-lived. The Word of God teaches us. Why? Because there, there are spiritual laws that God has employed that, that regardless of whether you follow Him or not, will produce the fruit that they were created to produce. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So, spiritual vision can be defined as our capacity to see clearly what God wants us to do and to see the world from his point of view. Tommy Tenney, an author, said this, a good eye is one that is fixed on Jesus. Now let us define discernment. Discernment is the quality of being able to grasp and comprehend what is obscure. The word obscure basically means it's not clear. It's vague. It's, it, you can't see that clearly. It's obscure. Discernment is the capacity or the quality of being able to grasp and comprehend what is obscure. Some people will define discernment as wisdom that comes from above or insight. Meaning God allows you to see what is not clearly perceived. That's discernment. And this is why discernment is so essential because you can be spirit led and face a situation that is obscure. And so you need, at that point, it's unclear so you don't have a barometer to measure you can't go, the, the word doesn't define it clearly. The circumstances don't define it clearly. At that point, you need God to unveil 
for you what really is happening. Amen. Are, are you hearing me? Yeah. So, so it's, it's a whole, it's a whole other level of trust with God where I'm not trusting in what I see. I'm not trusting in what I'm hearing. I'm not trusting in, in what I'm feeling. God, you have to help uncover this for me because I believe there's something behind this that is obscure. Right. Amen? Amen? Are you tracking with me? Absolutely. Solomon, when he became king, prayed for discernment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's recorded in 1 Kings 3, 7 through 9. He says, Oh Lord, you made your servant king instead of my father, but I'm a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. That I may discern between good and evil. Solomon understood that evil can often present itself as good. So he's saying, I need you, Lord. Isaiah spoke of the past and future ministry of Christ. And one of the things that he says about him is, it, 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 it is recorded in verse 4 or 5. And it says, and I shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes. Neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. Meaning the Jesus Christ himself is depending on Holy Spirit direction. The Son of God, Amen. God in the flesh, is trusting on the Holy Spirit to reveal what in the natural he's seen. That's powerful. In other words... Jesus will stand in judgment, not by sight or hearing, but by the leading of the Holy Spirit. The author of Hebrews teaches us that, that discernment or to be spiritually led and to have discernment is a sign of maturity. You find that in Hebrews chapter 5, 14, where it says, be strong. I mean, uh, but strong meat belongs to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of, you, uh, of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The New Living Translation reads it like this. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food, which we would often call meat in the, in the kingdom, is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. So, so I'm saying to the church, wherever I go, it's time to grow up. It, it's time to grow up. It, it's time, it's time to, 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 to have our, our spiritual sight and discernment exercised to a place where we're not tossed to and fro. Amen. So in order to grow from an infant Christian to a mature Christian, we must develop spiritual sight, discernment. We must train our conscience or our senses, our mind, our body to distinguish good and evil. I have a question for us before we move to the next point. Can you recognize temptation before it traps you? That's a good question. Can you tell the difference between a correct use of scripture and a mistaken one? That's a good question. Our capacity to feast on deeper knowledge of God or solid food is determined by our spiritual growth. Too often, people in church want God's banquet before they are spiritually capable of digesting it. As you grow in the Lord, you must put into practice what you have learned and your capacity to understand will grow. Now, let us shift gears. So you've heard me talk about spiritual sight and discernment. I've laid a solid foundation. Now I want to take you to a portion of scripture to emphasize how important this dynamic is. I'm going to read you one verse of the 16th chapter of Matthew. But I want you to study the entire 16th chapter. 
of Matthew. The reason is because the entire 16th chapter of Matthew, Jesus is dealing with this dynamic of perception. The whole chapter. But I'll read you one verse. It said in Matthew 16, 16. Let me, let me, let, who, do you have it there with you? Yeah. Can you re, stand up and read it out loud? Matthew 16, 16. Yep. Yeah. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's good. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. This is what's happening. Jesus takes the disciples, crosses the Galilee, enters a little town called uh, Caesarea uh, Philippi Caesarea Philippi now Caesarea Philippi was an interesting place because it was a place built by Herod the king of the Jews to honor Caesar because the Jews were under Roman rule right he was pretty much sucking up because the Romans were cruel to the Jews right so, so Jesus takes one trip his whole life and he lives in the region because he, he grew up in Nazareth which is right by the Galilee and most of Jesus' miracles are done in the Galilee. So Jesus takes them to Caesarea Philippi because Caesarea Philippi represents the seat of Roman power in that region. Imagine that a whole city is built or town to honor you. Jesus takes his disciples there and for the first time says to them, who do the people say that I am? And we know some of them said, well, the people say that you are this prophet, that prophet, this prophet. Then he goes to the no, 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 no. Who do you say that I am. And, and Peter responds, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And that's what Pastor Ryan just read, and Jesus responded to him, you are blessed, Simon, you are blessed, because no man has revealed this to you. He's, he's honoring Peter for having discernment. Mm -hmm. He said, you are blessed because my father has revealed this to you. And then he says, because you have this discernment, I give to you the keys to the kingdom or the authority. Now listen to this. Mm -hmm. well, that's a whole other teaching. Uh, I, I don't, don't want to go there. Keys of representation of authority, of authority. I give you the keys to the kingdom. Then he said this. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose in heaven will be loose. In other words, you got, you, because I have given to you this authority, which I have, you can, you can, you can, you can be a, move, a, 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 a mover and shaker. Okay? Things will have to listen to you. Because of this discernment that you have. Because you are connected to my dad. And my dad is speaking to you. you. You can represent right now. For real, for real. Okay? Then he goes on and, and he, begins to, he begins to talk to them. From that moment on, he begins to say to them that I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And, and they're going to kill me there. That's the first time he ever reveals this to them. And Peter, the man who had discernment, acts just like you and I often act, right after the Holy Ghost moment. We kick the bucket. We do something dumb that reminds us of our humanity. And Peter pulls Jesus to the side and rebukes him and says, yo, yo, bro, you got to chill out on that stuff. You ain't going to let nobody kill you. 
And listen to what Jesus says to him. Jesus rebukes him, basically says, get behind me, Satan. And, and I mentioned this the last time I was here. Why? Because you are mindful of the things of man and not the things of heaven. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that a carnal mind is a hindrance to divine purpose. This is why spiritual, to be spirit-led and to have discernment is so essential. Because as human beings, it's almost impossible for you and I not to be moved by carnal understanding. Human reasoning. Mm -hmm. It's almost impossible. In essence, making ourselves useless to the work of the kingdom. Because we're operating moved or driven by our natural senses and not by the spirit, which is the will of God. It's so important. Then if you go back to chapter 1, verse 1 of chapter 16... The whole 16 chapters about, about discerning. It starts like this. The Pharisees say, oh yeah, you know, and I'm paraphrasing of course, but just, just track with me. The Pharisees are giving Jesus a hard time because they don't believe he's the Messiah. And they say to him, give us a sign and then we'll believe. And he says to them, no sign's going to be given you adulterous and perverse generation except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Because they had no discernment, they didn't understand what that meant. But to us who have discernment, we know that the sign of the prophet Jonah was that he was three days in the belly of the whale. Jesus would spend three days in the belly of the earth, or in hell, after he died. And he came back to life, just like Jonah came back to life. Now, could you imagine seeing your, 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 your friend swallowed by a whale? You know you ain't thinking he's alive. It's done. All right. Hey. Those who aren't here, that means you, brother. <laughs> right? Yep. And three days later, the whale comes by, spits him out, and he comes walking out, yo, what's up? <laughs> you know, you'll be tripping out, right? Well, that's what he's talking about when he says that. This is the sign. The reality is that there were signs everywhere, but they could not see it because they were spiritually blind. They were not a people who were spirit-led. And definitely had no discernment. So that's the encounter in chapter 16. The second thing is then he says to the disciples that they get in the boat and they're going to cross over to Caesarea Philippi. He says to them, uh, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the disciples are like, oh man, we blew it. He's hungry and he wants bread and we don't have any bread. Jesus is talking about the behavior and attitude of the Pharisees. And they're talking about bread. Talk about this. Jesus is here. They're like. Again. He has to once again. Teach them. And then they go. Oh okay. Now we get it. Now we know that you're not talking about bread. You're talking about what the Pharisees. Or what that pharisaical spirit produces. Then they misidentify him. Why do they misidentify him? Listen to this. He asked them, who, are, who, who, who am I? Well, they tell him what everyone else is saying. In other words, they're influenced by popular opinion. Walking with the man, watching him do miracles, and they still have not concluded that this is the man. So again, one easy way of missing the will of God is to allow yourself to be caught up in popular opinion. Then it goes on to the Peter revelation, and then it goes on to the rebuke. So we see that the whole chapter <coughs> is speaking about this dynamic. This dynamic of discernment, which is so essential... Now, I'm going to bring this to a close. This dynamic of being spirit-led in discernment is not a New Testament concept only. If you, ever, if you ever want to confirm something, 
as it relates to God, God's will, try to find what is being revealed to you in the New Testament and have it affirmed in the Old. And that's a good way to confirm that, that this is God. Because you see the character and nature of God throughout the entire Bible. Mm -hmm. See, the Bible is comprised of 66 books. Poetry, songs, history, uh, laws. But it really is two contracts between God and man. An old contract and a new contract that in essence reveal the very nature and person of God. Amen. So when you read the Bible, you learn God. Who he is, how he thinks, how he feels, how he perceives. You, 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 you get a revelation. So, so, so I went to the Old Testament to, to see where God first deals with this dynamic of discernment as key and elemental in the growth and increase of his people. And I went all the way to the birthing of the 12 tribes. The 12 tribes of Israel, which are all the sons of Jacob. Jacob is the grandson of Abraham. Right? Abraham Isaac, Jacob. Jacob has 12 kids. They're a bunch of weasels, most of them. Right? They actually sell off one of their brothers to, to, to traitors, and, meaning Joseph, and come back and tell their dad that he got eaten by lions. These dudes were a trick. That's why I like the Bible, because it doesn't hide human weakness. But it shows God involved himself in it. So that if you're ever going through a hard time, there's always hope when you're connected to God. So we, we, we know that. But when, the, when, when Israel goes into Egypt as a nation, as a family of about 70 people, they come out hundreds of years later. The Bible teaches us that millions come out. Millions. And the first thing that God does is he brings them to himself to introduce himself because they haven't worshipped him for all these years in Egypt. And then he, he begins to, to give them a pattern for a tabernacle which is going to be God's presence in their midst. And he aligns the 12 tribes in order of function and significance. Now this is where it gets tricky. When you look at a map of the camp of Israel around the tabernacle, there was an order in which they were lined up. At the very front, when God would decide to move and they would have to strike the camp and, and fold it all up so it could become mobile, there were three tribes in the very front. The tribe of Issachar, the tribe of Judah, which is the tribe that Jesus comes from, and the tribe of Zebulun. This is what's interesting. Issachar was the tribe given the responsibility to be discerners and seers of what God was doing and how God was moving. And they were in the very front. Judah were the worshipers. They, they, they sang about the greatness and the goodness of God. In other words, as they were coming, everyone that was in any vicinity could hear, we are the people of the God we're talking about who's bad, ironically <laughs> speaking. Amen? Amen? Now check this out. Zebulon, you know what Zebulon's job was? To make money. To fund the work of the tribe of Issachar and of the, of the nation. 
So for those who don't understand the value of money in the kingdom, God puts the entrepreneurs, the creative thinkers, the people who knew how to take a dollar and turn it into ten, he puts them in the front because their worth is important. And he says part of your job is to pay for the Issacharians to not have to worry so that they can spend time discerning the times and, and, and getting the mind that I have for this nation. Powerful stuff. That's why I tell people when I've been preaching in churches that when a church experiences revival, the areas that the devil comes again against is the finances, the worship. Usually there's a split between those who worship and the pastor. <laughs> Somebody in the worship team begins to cause some problems. Any, if you talk to any pastor who's been pastoring for a long time, we say, there's nothing against you, pastor. No. But, <laughs> but you'll find often that because the, the, the creative gifts of, of instruments and singing is so powerful, people personalize it. So if you say, look, I want to give somebody an opportunity for somebody else to play, oh, but this is my gift. How, how, you know, and it, it, they, they personalize it. And you often see problems like that. Not everybody. I mean, we've got some incredible praise and worship people. And the seers, the prophetic gifts. The people who are there to hear, to see, to, to God spoke this to me. So this is important. Now, what I want to do is I want to give you some testimonies of the nation or the tribe of Issachar so that you can see how significant historically their influence to the progress of Israel was. In other words, I'm not just interpreting something I learned. There's testimony. So, for example, if, if I say, you know, Pastor Phil used to be this, 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 but God has delivered him, there has to be testimony that I've been delivered. Mm. Right. Right? Yeah. And it's that testimony that testifies that he is a different person. Yeah. Right? So we have to have testimony that the sons of Issachar truly were who I'm saying they were. So let me give you some background on the sons of Issachar. They were one of the 12 tribes of Israel. The sons of Issachar understood chronological time, but they also understood spiritual and political time. The sons of Issachar could discern what God was doing and, and when he was doing it. The, the, they knew when... When one move of God was ending and another was beginning. They could discern when a leader was falling and another leader was rising. They could even tell when, when, when uh, they could even tell you who the next leader should be. They knew who to follow and when to follow. Not only that, the sons of Issachar also excelled in knowledge of God's law, meaning his word. They were full of wisdom. In fact, God chose the sons of Issachar as one of the three tribes to go out in front of Israel whenever the nation moved. Judah, the praising people, went first. Issachar, the wise and discerning ones, and Zebulon, the financiers. That, that's, that's quite a combination. The sons of Issachar were sharp and so spiritually astute that the whole nation depended on them to know what they ought to do and when they ought to do it. Here are some examples of how wise and discerning these anointed people were. First of all, they supported a female ruler when it may not have been popular. In the times when Israel was governed by judges, before it had kings around 111 or 1100 BC or earlier, according to some scholars, a woman rose up to judge the land. Her name was Deborah. Although women did have rights in Israel, it would still have been unusual for a woman to sit in authority over the nation. Nevertheless, God was with Deborah. He placed her in authority, and the sons of Issachar knew it. Therefore, they sided with Deborah and went out to battle under her, under her leadership. Pretty gutsy move, huh? Why did they do it? Because they could discern the times and seasons, and they knew God's hand was on her, and it was her time to rule. They gained a great victory and freed the land from foreign rule. As a result, you can, you can see all the good things that happened to the nation at that time. You can read that in the book of Judges, chapter 5. That's where you can see that whole encounter. 
The Bible also records that they supported King David before he became king, when he was not popular with King Saul. He was in power at the time before King David, the second king of Israel, meaning Saul, uh, before King David began to reign. Now, the Bible teaches us that warriors from 12 tribes, from the 12 different tribes, started gathering to David. All the tribes were split in their support of David, except one tribe. They should have followed the leading of the Issacharians. Amen? Amen? The tribe of Issachar was united in their support of David. According to the passage quoted above from 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 31. Why did all Issachar support David? Because they knew that God had called him to become a king. They knew that his time had come. They could discern the changing of the times. It worked out well. Also, David became the next king and remains the most famous king of Israel in all history to this day. Beloved, spiritual vision and insight, discernment gave the Issacharians the discernment necessary, and this gave them a great advantage, a great advantage in facing life and its many twists and turns. The sons of Issachar had something special. Their ability to discern the time and seasons was an incredible advantage. This is what I'm trying to tell you. Being spirit-led and having discernment will automatically produce fruit in your life because God will lead you to make wise decisions and choices. I can't tell you in my 20, well, over 20, I've been counseling people in this county for, for 35 years. There are many businesses that have started because of counsel and advice that I give to people. Those who have prospered have been those who have kept Christ at the center of their business dealings. Those who today have not prospered is because they could not remain true to the word. And they still employ in their business practices non-biblical practices. And as such, they suffered. But I, I could name businesses that today are very popular and in that area, the most successful in Lancaster. And I can tell you, yes, I counseled him in the beginning. Yes, I counseled her in the beginning. And yes, the first thing I said to them was, make God the Lord of your business. Dedicate your business to God. And watch God give you the wisdom to prosper. In your marriage, God will give you the wisdom yes. to lead. In your parenting, I didn't have a good father who taught me how to father. I didn't, if I fathered the way my father fathered, I, I, I wouldn't be qualified to even sit in this church. That's how dysfunctional my father was. I had to learn how to father by the word. I had to learn how to husband by the word. I didn't see a good husband in my father. My father never married my mother and gave her six kids. So I didn't have a practical example of what a good husband, a good father, a good provider was. I had to learn it when I came to Christ. I had to learn it through the Word. I had to literally look into the Word and receive godly counsel to learn how to love my wife. To learn how to die to self. And I can tell you, I've not been a perfect husband. I've not been a perfect father. I have not been a perfect person. But I have been a righteous father. I have been a righteous husband. I have been a righteous person. Meaning that what motivates me is to do what's right. So if I misstep, I correct it. And I get back in line. Because I know God will bless righteousness. But resist prideful disobedience. And so this is important. You will have an advantage in your life if you purpose to be spirit-led 
and to develop discernment. This anointing gave them this knowledge and understanding of God's activities. They were not taken by surprise when things happened. They had influence as a result of their unique ability to understand times and seasons. They knew what Israel should do and when it should be done. The nation followed their example. In conclusion, church, this anointing can be yours today. Amen. That's the good news. But in order for you to have this anointing that was placed upon the Issacharians of, of discernment, being able to see what's obscure, especially in this time where the enemy is all around us and popular culture has become so godless and we are fulfilling New Testament prophecy that says in the last days people will be lovers of self more than lovers of God. They will love pleasure more than they love God. They will be disrespectful and boastful disobedient to their parents and to each other. Especially the fact that we are living in troubled times. The church of Jesus Christ has to stand out by being able to see beyond the fray. Amen. And navigate through that trouble in a manner that causes those to say, why, why are you different? Why are you successful? Why are you able to overcome such difficulties. And you will say. Because I'm spirit led. God is in control of my life. Amen. So this is the first thing you got to do. To receive this anointing. It's not hard. I'm going to give it to you real quick. Four points. Yes. There is a formula. Yes. Some things in the kingdom. Are very A, B, C, D. And this dynamic is A, B, C, D. If you want this kind of anointing, if you want to walk in this kind of understanding and revelation, the first thing you've got to recognize is that God is no respecter of persons. What does that mean? Romans 2.11 says, for there is no partiality with God. Acts 10.34 tells us that Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. What does that mean? That if God gave the sons of Issachar special spiritual ability, he's also able to give you and me the same ability. Amen. Because he's no respecter of persons. Meaning he didn't give it to them because they were his favorites. Yeah. He gave it to them because it was necessary for that nation to prosper and to progress in the midst of death and chaos. It's necessary for you and I to, to prosper and progress in the midst of this trouble so that the world can see that Jesus is the way. Yes. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Number two. Number one is recognize. Well, you, and why is that important? Because, because if you don't recognize that God is no respecter of person, you go, well, you know, I can understand why God's doing that with Phil because I can see how he lived. But me and, you know, I'm a, that, no, 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 no. All you got to do is ask. Amen. And, and you will automatically begin to align your life. Amen. See, in Christianity, you don't have to get it together first. Mm. You come to him just like you are. Amen. Broken, busted, and disgusted. And he mm. polishes you up and makes you shine. Yep. That's the beautiful thing of Christianity. That grace <coughs> avails you. Allows you to receive before. And then once you receive it, God helps you accomplish it. That gets me excited. The second thing is you know, you, you know that in Christ Jesus, all the blessings of, that God gave Abraham and his descendants, the Jews, also belong to you. So the first one is he's no respecter of persons. All the blessings given to Abraham, which is passed down to the Jews, also belong to us. Why? Galatians 3.9 tells us. <coughs> so then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. It talks about those who are of faith is faith in Jesus Christ. So those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Galatians 3.13-14 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. You and I are the Gentiles. In Christ Jesus. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Amen. So simply believing in Jesus brings into your life 
the promise of the Spirit of God, meaning God is now very much present in your life. God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because we are adopted into God's family through Christ, we are entitled to all the blessings of God. I like to, I mean that word entitled, but you can change that word entitled to qualify. We are qualified to all the blessings of Abraham. So now that you know you can have whatever God gave the Jews, you have only two. The third is ask. Amen. Amen. So the first one is know that he's no respecter of person. The second one is very simple. Know that in Christ Jesus, you are qualified to receive the blessings that by birthright was given to the Jews. You and I are by birthright what is our born again experience. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are born again. So we have the same birthright. The minute you repented and accepted Christ, all the blessings given to Abraham and the Jews are yours Amen. and mine. The presence of God in our lives. So all we got to do is ask. Ask God for this anointing of the sons of Issachar. Ask him to give you the ability to discern the times and seasons and always know what to do. All of God's promises are available to us. All we have to do is ask. And fourth and final, after you ask, start paying attention. Don't, don't, once you ask, don't just expect for you know, this bright light to flash and... You know, just start paying attention. It's that practical. Start paying attention. When you feel like something new is about to happen, it's because God getting ready to do something new. When you feel reluctant to make a certain decision just yet because you feel like it isn't quite time. When you feel like you shouldn't take on anything new right now because you feel like a new door is about to open. When God needs you to stand for something or someone that is biblically supported but isn't popular. When God starts to give you influence and people follow your example. That is the anointing of the sons of Issachar at work in you. Are you ready to see the anointing of the sons of Issachar at work in your life? All you got to do, again, is ask. <coughs> ask God for it right now. Always remembering this, that whatever God gives to us, even after we ask, he first offered it to us. Amen. John 15, 16, for you didn't choose me, is what Jesus said. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. And today, as I stand before this congregation and before these people, Lord God, seal this word in our hearts that more than ever in this life and in this season, we need to be spirit-led and to have discernment. Discernment that comes from above, that allows us to see past the hullabaloo and the obscure conditions that at times we find ourselves in. We can't define it by scripture. We can't define it by our past experiences. And it's there where we just need your spirit to teach us. And often, we just need to be still and know that you are God. And that you are in control. And that you will never leave us nor abandon us. And that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but that you deliver us out of them all. Yes. And so, Father, today, today we come before you. And we ask. If you embrace this word. If you embrace this word as a sign of you asking for this anointing, I want you to just stand right where you're at. Father, as we stand before you, we stand 
as a, as a declaration of our need. Not just to be spirit led, which many of us believe we are and live as such. But Lord, to have an anointing to discern, to see beyond what is tending to deceive, to see beyond the ploys of the enemy that wants us to settle for less and to fret at the sight of trouble so that we give up our peace. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to pour upon this place this anointing. This anointing and this charge given the sons of Issachar to see, to hear, to intercede. Father God, and just simply be a people who trust in you. Father, that, that we can continue to increase in whatever capacity you have placed us in. Whether it's as fathers, husbands, whether it's as Father God, uh, students, friends, wherever and whatever role we play in the world we're in, we need this insight. We need this discernment so that we can be delivered from the snares of the evil one. So that we can be able to, to recognize when the enemy is visiting us to try to cause us harm, pain, suffering. Because your word teaches us that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But that you have come to give us life in abundance. Yes. A life that increases, increases in knowledge, increases in capacity to, to see and to hear and that prospers even in the midst of dry places. Yes. We are to live like streams in the desert so that the parched and thirsty can come to us and find answers and solutions. Yes. So Father, we who are standing ask you to release this anointing, yes. to give us this anointing, Father God, not so that we can take pride in what we have, but that so we can serve others yes. with what we have. Yes. Amen. And so, Father, we can help others find their way. And in doing so, we become the fruitful people that you have called us to be. Producing fruit for your kingdom. Yes. Producing fruit, Lord God, that lasts forever. And so, Father, we thank you for this house. We thank you for the pastors of this house. We thank you for the faithful men and women of this house. And we release this anointing in and upon them. That it will flow from them. Even as oil flowed symbolically from the head to the feet of Aaron. As he was appointed high priest, Lord God. That there would be an anointing that would flow from the head to the feet of every man and woman and child that is in this place. Lord God, a fragrance that will be discernible and detectable by those who are still blind and deaf. And that they may cry out and say, you have something I need. Please tell me what it is. And Father God, we will testify of this reality. We will tell people of this reality and we will take no credit for it because we recognize that it is a free gift. It is your grace and your mercy that gives us this capacity. But we ask, we receive, and we celebrate you, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Give the Lord a praise, Thank you. Thank you for letting me preach to you. It has been a while. I don't remember when the last time I preached here, but man, it's always fun. I tell you, it felt really good in here, Pastor Ryan, just during your worship. I felt a, a real sense of peace and presence, and it, it was just powerful. I, I was in the back just, you know, I'm trying to preserve my voice, and I was shouting and 
just having a good time. So I, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Pastor Joe, for the for the for the work that you guys are doing here yes. and the the honest and, and, and genuine care that you are giving the people. Hallelujah. And Amen. and I know that, that that 2019 is gonna be a year of increase. Remember, Amen. you're entering your third year. Amen. Yes. The the foundation is complete. Amen. You hear that? The foundation is complete. Now you're gonna to begin to build Amen. on your third year. And, and so a lot of what you have here are pillars, but God's going to begin to give you uh, uh, things that are going to allow you to really see the house be a house that is fruitful and that is effective. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.